people do we have? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by the great Father Deacon Dr. Ananias. How are you doing today, sir? Christ is risen. I'm doing well. Truly, he is risen. Uh, yeah. Really excited for today's conversation. I've uh, been wanting to, we've kind of been going back and forth for probably about a month, just uh, thinking about setting up a date for something. Maybe he's talking about logos, maybe. But um, right. I asked you to come and talk about logical fallacies. Um, I felt like this would be really, really important. And uh, as you know, here in the Orthodox community, everybody loves debates. And I personally haven't done any debates, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'd be interested maybe in the future, but for me, I always want to stand firm in my ground before I do that. And I feel like these logical fallacies, being able to spot them is something that you and Dyer have such a skill at. And uh, if you, uh, that's why I asked if you could just come and talk to us about logical fallacies. Um, so I don't know where you would like to get started. You know, I purchased your, again, for all those, what, what, what is the status on your logic course? By the way, I mean, I, I purchased the first two lessons so I could get your book <laughs> that you're offering. And, yeah, the free uh, book. So what, what's the kind of status on that for anybody who might be interested in signing up for it? I have seven lectures done. Um, I've, I've kind of slowed it down because people it's getting more difficult. Um, I'm, I'm willing to add a couple more lectures, too, if, if people are interested. Um, and I've gone through, let's see, about five or six chapters. They're each lecture is about two hours long, and I simply just take the book that I teach at, you know, at the university or the college when I teach logic, and I simply just go through that. Um, PowerPoint slides um, are given to you as we go through my notes, and yeah, so right now I have about seven, and it, Let's see if you buy in bundles, obviously you get like discounted prices and stuff like that. So I think you get like each one normally is like 40 bucks. But if you buy all seven, it's like 230, which is like 50 bucks off. I think by the time you get six, you even get a free lecture and stuff like that. But oh, nice. mm -hmm. what's the best way people to contact you if they're interested in, in, in getting a hold of that? So that is let me just see if I can put this in the chat. It's through PayPal. Okay. Uh, and let me just look and see what my... It's through the eSorm at APU. It's linked to my... Oh, like it, Azusa Pacific was where I, my first job that I got after getting my PhD when I came back uh, from Ireland. And it's linked to that. Not my other... Just give me one second. I'll give. I'll pop Word. this up. And so, payments are made to PayPal, and then I immediately, you know, within a, a day, I'll send you a confirmation email that I've received payment registration and send you the what you call them, the lectures and powerpoints and book and personal slides and stuff like that. Here we go. I'm going to just put this in the chat. Da, 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 da. And then anybody can send that. It's funny when I'm, I, I don't know about you, when I try to multitask <laughs> and talk at the same time, it's like I'm reading, like pasting and copying. <laughs> it's all good. <clears throat> it's all good. You know, and one of the reasons why I think your course is so valuable, we were kind of talking, uh, you know, before we went live here is I'm, working on my PhD, I'm, I'm almost, you know, I can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel regarding the dissertation and this whole process of which gets mm -hmm. uh, really uh, bureaucratic and nauseating. Um, God, God but, bless you. Yeah, I, I wish I knew what I was signing up for when this was the dream as a 22-year-old <laughs> that I'm going to be a university professor and then now I'm on YouTube and trying not to be part of the university. But um, we were talking about how, how rare logic is and that I've made my way through, uh, 
university all the way up to the highest point that people are supposed to attain education and not once was there a requirement for a logic course not once was there a professor who taught by talking about logical family talking about logical consistent ways to think about ideas and it really wasn't until i was introduced <clears throat> at the graduate theological union to people who do more systematic theology and yeah. and again, I was a non-believer at the time. I was very much into psychedelics, and so my whole worldview was really wrapped up in phenomenology. And encountering these people that they they could just speak so eloquently, and they're hitting me with these logical val, you know, and deconstructing me. And it's like, okay, well, I need I need to start looking into this stuff. And in that process of getting serious about logic and consistency, and not contradicting myself and my worldview was essential in relationship to, to reading Orthodox theology and then me becoming Orthodox. And so, if you could, again, make, before we even get into the fallacies, just speak on, as somebody who's so well-versed in this field of philosophy, looking at the world right now, looking at uh, just everything that's going on and the absence of logic, the absence of anybody looking at anything in a systematic way. Yeah, I, I find it funny that the way that you were introduced to logic. I found logic because um, deep down in my heart, I wanted to refute my parents um, <laughs> and win every argument with that's what my inspirate not. <laughs> Maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. Uh, but I think one of the problems is, and again, logic used to be a prerequisite, um, certainly for philosophy. I think one of the problems is that just kind of a break away from the kind of traditional classic liberal arts uh, education and that everybody, and it kind of mirrors also both the moral and kind of political uh, milieu that Everybody has their own, everything's reduced to everybody's micro lifestyle choices, right? right? So, well, your education's like that too, that, well, you can just pick whatever you want, um, which is really strange because, I mean, if the whole purpose is to gain knowledge and you come into the university ignorant, um, how are you going to know if you don't have knowledge what courses to pick, what are going to be formative to you in the best way possible? And so I think eventually you see what you do today, a kind of breakdown in the overall um, education system and the way people are being educated, or should I say, um, not educated. They just, everybody gets to choose their buffet of whatever they want. Um, just like morality and lifestyle choices, you get to take whatever courses you want. So in times past, it was very much structured that you would have something like, I mean, the, the very trivium and quadrivium and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that, you know, logic rhetoric um, was, was important in the foundations of. Also, I would say when the culture kind of destroys the notion of, and I've talked about this, uh, that I call it uh, falling along Eric Vogelin, modern Gnosticism, <laughs> that uh, the, there's something fundamentally wrong with the world, right? right. So what, it, what does a Gnostic do? Um, oh, and by the way, that's God's fault or whoever created it. <laughs> right. So get rid of that. So you see that in philosophy, right? Like um, the death of God. Right. And then also an abolition of reality and nature. So you deny it. You deny the way things really are. And then what does the Gnostic do? They build a dream world <laughs> yeah. that they live in. Um, and so what I argue is that once you do that, once you kind of commit a Nietzschean deicide, and this Promethean rebellion and hatred towards God and reality and nature, then there are no more restraints. Man becomes God and the libido dominandi is the ruling principle uh, right. that kind of will to power. Right. And so I think what the only thing of really kind of value, especially of those who have power is power. So 
uh, why teach people logic and um, when you know you can just do propaganda? <laughs> and you notice this in technology <laughs> and commercials. Um, what do you get this in uh, f- film theory, montage theory, right? Mm-hmm. You all you have to do is get one picture and a second picture put together equals a third idea. That's like TV. It's like TV logic, right? So it's not an actual argument, but it's a a surrogate for actual logic and thinking. And I think you and I, before we just went on, we're talking about too, just people don't appreciate how much work it takes of like actually studying and reading all those books behind you and going over and over and working these things out right that that's really what it takes it takes hard work and getting your your hands dirty exactly. to kind of get in and master you know i don't even say master like just be a novice sometimes at this material um but the kind of modern technological age which really kind of is the same temptation that the devil gives us right you can get it all f- for you know no work right away um why work hard and go you know do this and and develop these kind of virtues when you can have virtue in a bottle or a pill or a, <laughs> right um and so i i kind of think that that's the way everything's condensed and shortened right even like cinema right if you put somebody in I don't know, like a, a Herzog film or they'd be like, I don't even understand what's going on. Everything has to be compressed into like sound bites. Everything's short and everything's sped up. It's super easy. Um, and in fact, I think the way that media and technology works is it does the thinking for you. You're passive. That's what makes us so prone to um, the influences of propaganda and deception and stuff like oh, wow. that, Great which point. should be an argument that um, more than ever, logic and critical thinking um, are valuable in the midst of that because we live in an age. But I I think kind of overall, I know it's a broad brush to paint with, but that probably explains why it's not valued. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's doesn't, it's not necessary. Um, It's not seen as necessary and the entire ethos, um, it goes against that. It's, you know, like, well, we could just get you to the same place um, with these images. Right. So I think that's why we don't see it for, for all the reasons I just stated. So I have a question related to that is, again, for me, getting much more logical about my worldview was part and parcel of becoming orthodox as well. And so now we, again, I'm very, as this channel, we worship yeah. the logos. <clears throat> this is the source of logic itself. And so... Um, the perniciousness, as you're talking about the media, modern technology, keeping people in sort of sedated, immediate states of desire, uh, prevents them from engaging in more critical discussions, critical yes. analysis, or even building a body of knowledge is just like building your body in general. It's, it takes so much time and effort long term. It's a long term goal. But how does the absence of logic, again, we look at the, f- the degeneracy of our society, you know, God, I don't, I don't think we can say the Western world or America is still a Christian nation. And so I would, I feel like we'd have to, or again, maybe you, you go wherever you want, but the absence of logic, the absence of principles, the absence of, of con- cognitive conceptual boundaries allows the, the degeneracy and the lack of God we now experience in our society. Yeah. Um, there's a great article about, Um, from Philip Sherrard on kind of technology and, you know, I mean, that's the problem is that, and I even make the argument, it's not just with logic, but even science itself Mm -hmm. uh, is abolished and corrupted. Now, of course, people always, they'll do non-science and call it science um, in the same way that people do illogic and call it logical. Um, there's kind of a a swindle there, right? Like a sleight of hands that, um, but it it comes because of the, exactly what you said, the system and kind of age that we live in, that that itself needs to be identified and deconstructed in some way. And so I I think some possible solutions are 
the very fact that you have these kind of intentional communities that are formed mm-hmm. um, and at a very basic level, just like even homeschooling, that you're breaking away from the system that's actually abolished and corrupted that. And then you're going back to the classic method and tradition that they re- purposely rejected. And you're embracing that. And then you're beginning to, within your intentional communities, teach and train people in good reasoning and logic and the faith and, and morality and ascetics and stuff like that. Right. I mean, because even the way you or die or do orthodox apologetics, it, it rests on highlighting these internal contradictions within other systematic forms of theology, i.e. Roman Catholicism <laughs> or Protestantism or Islam and its Neoplatonic mm-hmm. sort of schematics and framework. Mm-hmm. So I, it, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, then not just logic, but all the uncreated energies, you know, they, they rise to a new importance as being orthodox. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, they're true because uh, they, they come from God's divine energies. Um, and, you know, anyone to participate in that. And, you know, if, especially if God's given us minds, we want to, it's a gift like anything we want to use it uh, to the best of our ability and refine it and it's like the parable of the talents right i want to return back my talents um fourfold like i invested in it god here i give it back to you whatever whether that's the mind or anything that we have that i don't want to bury it i don't want to squander it bury it and then return it back it's you know um the same amount i want to you know, do something with it, which is the very notion of being Eucharistic and liturgical Hmm. that we, we take nature, right. The things that that the God's gifts and we work it. I mean, even like the prosphora, if you think about that, we take, what does God give us? He gives us the grains in the, the fields. We work them. We put work into his gifts and then we make that into we, you know, we and, and and bread, and then we offer back up even the liturgy. Thine own of thy own mm. is what the. Um, so, I think there's a way that we can approach that with the gifts of the mind and logic itself too. That it's a gift, and we're liturgical and Eucharistic beings that work that, make it something more, and offer it back in thanksgiving to God. Right. Well, moving then and more towards our topic of discussion today. Fallacies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is logical fallacies, because it seems like then these run rampant in our society, and the authoritative figures that at least they are placed on those pedestals in our society, uh, they make these veridical claims, these truth claims in the world constantly through these fallacious logical arguments. And so... Uh, maybe, and, and you take us wherever you want to take us, but but maybe to open with is talk about the difference between a, a formal fallacy and an informal fallacy. Right. So, so you know what makes something a, a fallacy, right? It's not true. <laughs> I don't know. No, there, there's a group of secret men in a scientific um, underground uh, laboratory, <laughs> um, and they're the infallible magisterium of uh fallacies uh society and they they basically arbitrarily they they take uh they cut off a head of a chicken and they let it run around um a little table as they play the gazoo and they throw out coffee grounds and chicken bones and stuff like that and however that lays out that's how they develop what's going to actually be the new fallacy and then that gets recorded into a book and published um i bet none of you knew actually how fallacies actually work but there is a secret society that i I had no idea what happens behind closed doors but now i do (laughs) it's funny because i I mentioned that because sometimes people say there's no such thing as that fallacy um and i joke like well do you think that there's like some secret group of like old men that are like the infallible magisterium of fallacy. They just like create a list of what these are and they're not fallacies until they say so. 
it's like just fiat or something. I think some people probably believe that or, you know, well, kind of intuitive. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think that general disposition is as a society, and we're seeing this with the mass stuff, we're seeing this with the pandemic, but is trust that everybody's the appealing to other authority, <laughs> right? To use yeah. logic is to take one's authority and bring it back to themselves. And that I'm yeah. the arbiter of trying to decipher what's true and not true. But again, because people don't have these skills, they're always appealing to the institutional authorities that were given. Right. And I made, that's why I made kind of an, um, a joke. I was making reference to the kind of South Park episode where about the, the economy, right? So economics is supposed to be like the science, but nobody, it's like so complicated. Nobody can figure it out. And I think Kyle's got the Margaritaville. <laughs> So he was like trying to figure out like that the but then there's like all these funny things that like um the economy is now pers personified thou hast made the economy angry that's why it's like which is funny because this is the way people kind of talk about science sometimes right. they like personify it like it's this like deity right. that um like has this infallible knowledge so then they go to this he has to figure out the price of the margaritaville uh is that what it's called? The what are the the thing? Yeah, that blends the little margaritas. Mm -hmm. And he goes and there's like a hidden kind of council, right? Of uh, like elites and eco economists, and it ends. Uh, so those are the experts, right? Like trust the experts. So on the surface, it's like um, these people. These are the people we put our trust. They obviously look like they know what they're doing. Um, whether they're, you know, economists or scientists wearing lab coats or something like that. But in the end, like they're just appealing to um, arbitrariness and like he's got this like wheel of fortune kind of thing, like uh, with the chicken head. Remember, he's doing the gazoo right. and it lands on bailout, bailout. <laughs> and that's basically how everything's determined. Um, but it's important to like ask, like, you know, what makes somebody experts? Like what? Um, how do we trust them? Why should we trust them? Coming back to the logic, it's not the experts that determine whether something true or false. They don't make it true or false. They don't make logical fallacies. What a fallacy is, is something that doesn't follow. So all fallacies are non sequiturs. Mm. Now, there's many different ways that we can err in reasoning in which things don't follow and you can name those and typically in logic you have the distinction between what's called formal fallacies and informal or fallacies of relevance now a formal fallacy involves an error in the form or arrangement of the actual argument or syllogism itself mm. So that's why, so for example, there's things like uh, affirming the, the, uh, the consequent, um, elicit, um, to remember the, there are uh, affirming the consequent, uh, denying the consequent, um, there's some disjunctive fallacy, formal fallacies, undistributed middle, is uh, another fallacy and again all of that has to do with the kind of formal structure of your syllogism mm -hmm. and we could go back over and i could give some examples of that so but, those include propositional quantification yeah. and then the formal syllogistic so yeah um so for example let's say we, uh, a deductive argument mm -hmm. A valid deductive argument is one in which if the premises are true, the conclusion has to follow. Mm -hmm. Now, why? Well, it's because the way those terms, right? Whether So you have the subject in the first premise, the subject and a middle term, and then the predicate in the middle term so that the way that those are arranged logically the, they connect if you plugged in the right content so it's like the formula is correct that's what valid the form and structure is good mm. so if you just put the good stuff in you're going to get the good stuff out <laughs> but there's ways that what happens if you mess up on the structure of it right so it's not a good form 
well, then you can have a formal fallacy. Right. Um, so let me give you an example of, let's see, like a, a conditional, right? Um, if P, then Q. So if it's, if it's raining outside, um, then I'm going to carry an umbrella or something like that. Um, then I affirm the antecedent. It's raining outside. Therefore, I'm carrying an umbrella. That's a modus ponens. There's nothing wrong with that. But watch what if I did like this. Um, if it's raining outside, I'm carrying an umbrella. I'm carrying an umbrella. Therefore, it's raining outside. That's actually called a formal fallacy of affirming the consequent. That doesn't follow. Right. So something, yeah, that you actually... So if I put the first premise, if P, then Q. Mm -hmm. Second premise, Q, therefore P. Well, that's a non sequitur. It doesn't follow. Well, why doesn't it follow? It doesn't follow because they're not actually logically connected. You structured them wrong. So that would be an example of like a formal fallacy. I see. And you can also have denying the antecedent. So um, when it's not raining, then the road is not slippery. Um, it's like the inverse of, or if I, let's, let's say, uh, if it's raining, I'm carrying an umbrella. It's, I'm not carrying an umbrella, therefore it's not raining. Hmm. That's, that, that doesn't follow. Right. Okay. So that'd be denying the antecedent. Um, I'm trying to think of other. Oh, here's one. Undistributed middle. All cats are animals. Premise one. True? That's true. All cats are animals. Premise two. Lion is an animal. A lion. Therefore, lion is a cat. Um, that would be... Okay um an example of cats and animals so the middle terms like switched out and that would be valid but not very sound so let's do an undistributed middle um this is funny it's called sometimes called the politician politician syllogism um i guess it goes back this uh goes back to there was a british tv show on bbc called yes prime minister um, we must do something. This is something. Therefore, we must do this. <laughs> is another. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other examples. So I just want to give you like like obviously the various problems with um, those are formal or structural problems, and then we could talk about like well what the heck is an informal fallacy? Yeah, go ahead. Like don't let me just keep going on. No, if you no, have any that's, questions, that's just what... stop. Go right ahead into the the informality <clears throat> of the fallacies. Because I was going to ask you then, once you explain the inform informal fallacy, is what do you think is most do most po people fall victim to? Because it seemed like the informal. There's a lot more quote unquote. Oh yeah, it's always inform. It's almost always informal. Okay. Yeah. Um, and less. So oftentimes, what you have to do. What's good about logic is that you translate ordinary passages into their logical form. So most people aren't actually going and structuring like, uh, like a syllogism, mm -hmm. like when they're presenting arguments. You're reading editorials, you're watching the TV, and it's your job to basically condense that and be like, what would the premises be? What are the implicit premises in there and what's the conclusion? And as I teach, like, there's conclusion indicator words, um, premise indicator words and stuff like that. And then you have to form that into a syllogism and then identify, like, is it valid? Is it uh, sound? Which means that 
it's good structure and all the premises are true. Is it invalid? Right? It's an incorrect logical form. Um, you know, what type of fallacy are they committing or something like that? By the way, here's another good one, uh, formal fallacy. All bullfights are grotesque rituals. All executions are grotesque rituals. Therefore, all bullfights are executions. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. So it's actually, if I, now notice, you'll kind of get this with vegans, right? They'll, they'll tend to actually do these sorts of arguments. Mm. So that's why um, perhaps they don't actually put it in a syllogism, but you're hearing something you're saying, and you would repeat back to them. So, okay, this is your premise here. You know, all bullfights are grotesque rituals. All, and you're saying all executions are grotesque rituals. Therefore, all bullfights are executions. Like, is that something like that? Right. Um, but for the most part, you're going to come across with uh, informal fallacies. So maybe we should talk about those. So if the so, then if the informal, so the formal fallacy is the way in which the syllogism is set up. Yeah, it's incorrect. What's the, the structure. What, what's the basis of the informal fallacy? The informal fallacy is called fallacies of relevance, um, and they don't have so much to do with the logical structure that's being presented, but they're. It's just they have premises of course, and they have a conclusion. But the premises are not actually logically relevant to the conclusion. Mm. That's why I say it doesn't follow. Right. There's no kind of logical connection. There's no necessity or something like that. Um, or it's just simply a downright like error. that like Because that's what people are trying to do. What is a premise? A premise is a statement um, or sentence that's offering support for a conclusion. Um, <clears throat> and the conclusion is the thing that's being purported to follow from what supports it. Mm. So what happens when people's proposed support has no bearing on the conclusion? It, it doesn't support it. It doesn't follow. There's no logical connection there whatsoever. Then you've done... Uh, what's called fallacy of relevance or uh, informal fallacy. So what? When I wrote down again, I'm no expert in this stuff, but I wrote down the improper premise regarding informal fallacies: improper premise, faulty generalizations, questionable cause, relevance fallacies, and red herring fallacies. <coughs> it, seems, it seems like red herring kind of embodied most of the ones that I'm familiar with as a novice. Uh, could could you just kind of discuss a little bit more about the, all these types of informal fallacies? I mean, there's tons of them. Yeah, and again, you can come up. It's like people will be like, that's not a fallacy. Well, there's nothing. It's sort of like a, uh, to point out another fallacy. It's sort of like the word concept fallacy. Um, there's nothing important about that word. Like, it's not the word or the phrase. Uh, you know, red herring that makes it a fallacy. It's the concept of what the word red herring is referring to. Um, so that's an illicit mood. It's something that, that doesn't follow. Um, it's not connected logically to whatever conclusion that you're trying to establish. So red herring comes from, it's just kind of a clever name that <clears throat> suppose you're a criminal and they you're broken out of jail and they've got the bloodhounds on you so father i don't mean to cut you off people My robot people are upset yeah they're, they're talking about your audio again you sound absolutely clear to me i hear no crackling i hear no cyborg robot type voice i have no idea what exactly they're referring to you sound crystal clear to me on, on my end looking on Streamlabs, yeah, you're coming across perfectly clear. All the all right, I got it, I got it, I got it. How about this better? Um, Is that better, guys? I might have too high of uh, input on. That might have been it. Let's see, how's how's it now, everyone? How's it now, guys? Better. You're a little quiet, at least on my end. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, I turned it down on. I was just thinking I had the input too high. So. Yeah, you definitely lowered it. I mean, again, I hear no crackling at all on my end. So I don't know why through YouTube or through Streamlabs they're getting yeah, a there's something going on with Streamlabs that better. I don't think no, it's not. Not better. Shoot, how do we fix this? Um. Try try moving it back to your computer microphone. See if that. Yeah, we could do that. I mean, those they should still be able to hear you just to see if that makes any difference. We were just talking about this before. Right? <laughs> I know, and that's what. It, and you sound fine to me. That's what I can't get. It was the same thing that we had with one of Jay's strings. It seems like they're coming in fine. Um, so everything on my end was fine, everything on his end was fine, but when it went through YouTube, it got all messed up. Um, so... Well, let's just do it all over again. Let's do it all over again. start from the beginning. <laughs> well, we were just getting into the informal fallacies. Um, Let me see what you guys... Yeah. So... So I... <laughs> Yeah, somebody said, okay, he seems fine. Uh, okay, yeah. Here, he's super loud. I can turn you down on Streamlabs so it's, you're not so loud. Does that work better for people? I don't, I don't get it. That's what makes no sense. You sound perfectly fine to me. Okay, now they're saying it's worse. Hmm. Um, um, so maybe move revert back to your microphone, I guess. Is there a way to reconnect? I mean, it, that's why I don't get it. It's, it's, you sound fine. Yeah, just flip back to the microphone, I guess. If, if you have to sound like a cyborg, that's better than them complaining that it sounds ter terrible with the... No, I, I, nobody was saying anything. I mean, it, you sounded fine to me the whole time. <laughs> Still digitized. What the heck? I don't... I don't, I don't, he was fine at first and then it went sideways. Well, nothing changed. I think it's the spirits of the air. <laughs> I mean, we can if, let's restart this. Right. Well, you sound fine to me. Um, I can't even hear the, I can't even hear the robot now. Literally doesn't even sound like words. What? And then Big Brain Jansen, Jason says audio quality on point. I don't get it. <laughs> all right that's it i'm gonna pull it up on my phone to, to hear what this all sounds like D driving me nuts people are asking it's uh we can't hear uh you see you sound perfect to me right now what it makes no sense. So it's a YouTube problem. It must be. It's not Kotel's problem. It's not my problem. I don't know why you guys are getting upset at us. It's not Streamlabs. 
Or is it? Or it's not zooming. Oh, okay. So it's you sound. That's so weird when you speak. Yeah. It's it. There, there's like a clicking noise in the back, and it sounds like you're a million feet away from the microphone. Okay, so we can restart this. Uh, we can restart this real quick if that's gonna that's gonna help. I have yeah. no idea why why it's doing that. And everybody says it was fine, and then all of a sudden it went sideways. Well, nothing changed. Nothing changed. <laughs> uh, okay. So, yeah, you're... All right. Well, we'll just shut down the stream real quick, and we'll, <laughs> we'll come back in. We'll double-check all the microphone stuff, because I have no idea. I can't do any... On my end, everything is perfect. I hear him clearly. I don't hear the popping sound. He, he's, he doesn't sound like a million feet away when I'm talking to him. So, um, so I guess let's just shut it down and try it again.